media mogul and influencer Russell Simmons spoke with the student body here at Bourbon Day High School. He talked about his new book, Super Rich, The Guide to Having It All. I'm Michael Real. This is realurbannews.com. guys for about an hour and John Singleton a bunch of other great people we're so excited to be able to have Russell with us today and what we talk about in the film class uh, a lot is that you need to be your own man and uh, try to create your own opportunities and that in the heart of it is just being an entrepreneur and this guy is the king of all of them and been an inspiration to me since I was growing up in Long Island so ladies and gentlemen Russell Simmons <laughs> so I came in, I had my Yankee hat, and I was like, well, go stand and fix my <laughs> But um, I thought I was coming to speak to, I didn't look at my schedule, I knew I was coming to speak to some high school students in Watts. And I like that, right? I always like going like where people need me most. And usually I go to the hood and some, some school, and most of the people are not getting out of school, and none, none of them are going to college. So when I got here, it's like, why am I here? Like, I, sh I should be somewhere else. But it's always good to make good better. So I'm inspired by you. I mean, when I was your age, I didn't know, I didn't have the direction you had. I didn't have a school like you had. You know, the only difference, I think, between you and the kids in the other schools is that you know better. And that's what I always talk about is consciousness, being aware of what your opportunity is and being aware of what your purpose is. Y'all thought we wrote a letter to the president yesterday? As all the celebrities wrote, I wrote a letter and all signed it and gave it to the president. About drugs. About drugs destroyed the communities. Y'all don't know that. Should I tell them that? Mr. Simmons, thank you for being with uh, RulerBenews.com. Briefly, speaking with the students here at Bourbon Day, you talked about this letter that you all wrote to the president. Yeah, Dr. Boyce and I wrote it. Tell us about that letter. Um, it's something I've been working on. I've been working on for many years. We we had a rally, um, I don't know, a little over 10 years ago. 100,000 kids came. Jay-Z came. Senator Clinton came. Must have been 15 years. 10, 10, 12 years ago. Senator Clinton, Reverend Sharp, all the civil rights organizations supported it. But it was really it was really Puffy and Beastie Boys and Run DMC and LL Cool J and the Wu-Tang Clan and Ja Rule and 50 Cent. They, they came. Mariah Carey came. Wycliffe got arrested. We brought 100,000 people to, to the governor's office and we made a big deal, big enough that it became an ongoing dialogue until one day the governor just signed the pen, signed the, uh, the, the bill and gave me the pen, which I never, you know, hold that pen. Um, it was a big, it showed us something, one, that we could get it done and we had to. And two, you know, uh, well, especially that we could get it done. And that was the main message and, and that then that we pushed more on the next governor came in with a couple of governors later with Patterson. Sure. And Governor Patterson was a senator that marched with us and we had to go and rally again. We had to go in because even though he was the governor, he still had lobbying to do. But we changed the law and thousands of people came up from jail. And there was a movie made at that time about that experience and one family was how it was affected. And it's always stuck in me as something I have to be part of the process of completing. And so uh, Dr. Boyce and I were talking about this this thing and this pressure on our community, how it, what it created, and so we decided to write that letter. And then I, you know, I thought it would be good to have it endorsed by Hollywood and by the hip hop communities and other than we went out and got the endorsements and we wrote the letter. So the letter went to the White House. It made a lot of news. It was good. 
and it's a good setup. You know, and Justin Bieber tweeted to 37 million people. Wow. I didn't know how many. I didn't know he had 37 million people. Uh, yeah, 37 million people. It's a small tweets. country. <laughs> Could you imagine he tweeted? That, and so with his tweet, I, I, I spoke to one of our leaders in our community. He said, I don't sign petitions. Uh, and I would never say what this was. I can call the president. I spoke to Richard Branson, but he signed a letter. Right, right. Exactly. right. So she didn't want to do it, so I said, I'm going to call Kim Kardashian. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. Kim tweeted, at another 20 million people. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it was really about the social capital that I was looking for anyway, but it was nice to have, you know, I'm glad, I was blessed to have, like, people like Harry Belafonte sign it. Wow. Mm -hmm. Like, people who inspire me. Sure, you know? sure. Um, Dr. Ben Chavis, you know, people who really have done a lot of good work in our community are on there, too. I'm sure the president would look at their names and, and wave them. He might keep going to read the letter. Yeah, he read the letter. Of course he read yeah. it. He read it. And the White House was, you know, there was a moment the White House was happy to receive it. And there was a moment there was so much media mm -hmm. about it brewing that they wanted to, you know, we have to prioritize when is it good. <laughs> it's never good for, for any kind of start, you know, it's, there's never a timing mm -hmm. for justice. Like, there's always like, oh, we'll do that later. Okay. Mm -hmm. You know, and, and when I was working with the gay community, they didn't like the letters and the work we were doing. So we'll get it later. So, no, we're going to keep pressuring you now. When I'm working with, any subject, even animal rights. You know, people are like we'll talk. We're not talking to young brands on behalf of a, um, a, a PETA and negotiating deals. And I know it may sound odd to you, chickens, but they're like, no, let's, we'll we'll change that later. Mm -hmm. No, we gotta change it now. But we're gonna keep picketing. So young people have to be the catalyst, the catalyst to change what's wrong in their community. And the drug laws have been one of the most devastating things that happen. And also, one small note that. Black and brown people are 10 times more likely to go to jail for the same drug offense as their other counterparts. 10 times for the same offense in front of the same judge. That's an inconsistency that even if you thought being a druggie was a jail, the kind of thing you put people in jail for 10 years for, you would say it's so inconsistent you'd still get rid of the law. So we're trying to change the law. We did this in New York State about 10 years ago. We were very successful. We changed the laws dramatically. And now we're trying to change the federal laws and educate people on this subject. And speaking in terms of now, speaking this afternoon with the students, you talked about uh, the war on drugs. And when you. It's a war on black people. We got to the chase. Mm -hmm. It's a war on black people. It's, it's, it's like slavery. So the prison industrial complex. How damaging has this destroyed this drug the fabric into of the black community? Lots of places in black. Nationwide. People. Nationwide. Lock us up, teach us to be violent criminals, and drop us back in the hood with no hope. And they did so much of it that jail culture became the core um, culture in our community. You know, then some poet tells you about it, and you're shocked to hear it, but it's our reality. You know, it's a reality that exists in these communities, and it's from people who are locked up. You know, and and you know, and it's what's so unjust about it. Not only are the laws crazy, and the laws do serve to the, the, the lobbyists and the, the prison industrial complex, but it's so unjust because, it, you know, when you have stop and frisk and 99% of the kids in New York uh, that are stopped are black, 99% stop and frisk victims are black or brown. So if you've got drugs in your pocket, you know, mm -hmm. and, you, and you lose it, and you get arrested and you go to jail, or you have a police record, mm -hmm. your life is ruined. Ruined. And it's from stop and frisk, and you know, you didn't have a gun, they were looking for a gun, but they got, you know, a little bit of drugs. I took every drug. There's no drug I didn't take. A lot of them. You know, I don't drink now, I don't smoke now, I don't take anything now, but I had that experience. It didn't make me a bad person. It made me less focused, perhaps, you know, but it didn't make me bad. How do we change that culture? Well, we, have, we, have, we know how it doesn't work. We have to just educate the masses so that they can make the politicians make a change. Until then, the politicians, and, and then, which is the core. The big problem that I, you know, I had slept in the street occupied. I occupied all over the country. Right. And I did it because I felt that um, Wall Street, they said occupy Wall Street. Wall Street controlled our government. It's the money that controls. They can't breathe without the money. So they can all, so it always goes back to the money. Whether it's the prison industrial complex, they spend $10 million in lobbying fees and make tens of billions of dollars in, in, in return for it because they alter the laws, and the laws then, you know, incarcerate our people and fill their beds, their hotel rooms, or their prisons. Right, right. Finally, as we go forward into this uh, 21st century, what's the African-American focus in terms of family, community, well, education? 
That's a lot of questions. Oh, that's, <laughs> that's a big one. Let's package that. You know, um, um, we always hear about post-racial America, and we don't see it except for unless we turn on um, Jerry Springer. Or, but we know it's really it's happening in front of us more than we would have believed. And um, I think that, you know, there's a, and I talk about it, you know, I'm, I'm really a fan of, of getting kids to see the whole world. Yeah, so he was, he's up at uh, Holy Names up in, in Oakland. He flew down for this to come see you. So this is Darius, yeah, so he's going to be talking. I'm good, how you doing? Good. How you doing? Okay, now these are our other students. Come in and introduce yourselves to Mr. Russell. How you doing? Tell them what your major is, what your grade is, and where you work. Major? I don't know, I have to decide my, my grade point average is 3.7. <laughs> I work at Kirkland Atlas, yeah. so I'm downtown. Biggest, one of the biggest ones I'm the biggest friends. I am Zachary Burge. Probably a sophomore. Thank you for the opportunity. How you doing? How you doing, Mr. Fraser? Yes, sir. My name is Yes, sir. I'm Dylan. I'm a sophomore here. Kobe Kelly. Kobe Kelly. Kobe like Bryant. My name is Mike Hughes. I'm a freshman. My name is. Montez, I work here in Pasadena with Vanessa. Vanessa, we are going to I'm a junior here. So, uh, Mr. Simmons, before you go, uh, we have a few parting gifts. Awesome, Mr. Simmons. Uh, we uh, obviously appreciate you coming.